Okay, we're up to 40 people. So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. First thing I wanna do is welcome you to my home. Um, and I will say that although I've done many, many of these um, baklava workshops, I've always done them in person. I've never done a video version. So this is new to me, um, but I hope that you guys will have a little patience with me as things go along. Uh, the first thing I would do when someone comes to my home is I would make tea or I would already have tea made actually. And we're gonna talk about Persian tea a little bit later as we're waiting for the baklava to cook. But I want to um, turn around here and show you a little bit about how I start the tea and then we'll come back. So Alex, you want to swing us around? Mm -hmm. All right. I'm working with loose leaf tea and I'm working with a stovetop samovar. This is um, similar to the samovars that a lot of Persians have in their home. Actually, everybody has one of these because they don't use the big fancy ones anymore. You can see that big fancy one over on the other side there and we'll talk about that in a few more minutes. But right now, I just want to get started making my household uh, tea using my stovetop samovar. So I'm using um, loose leaf tea, as you can see. And I'm going to put about two spoons of that into this top teapot. And what I'm putting it in is actually a, a strainer. I've already had the water boiling. So in this bigger part of the samovar, there's a lot of hot water, boiling water. I'm gonna pull that forward a little and put the water in my smaller teapot. Now I'm gonna put this back up on top. And I guess you can, it's a little hard to see from where you are, but there's actually a hole in the top here. So the steam is gonna come out through the middle up to the top teapot. So that's gonna steep. And usually about 15 minutes is good. So we're just getting that started. All right, let's go back over here. Normally when you come into a Persian house, the first thing they're gonna do is offer you tea um, and they're gonna keep offering it the whole time you're there. So uh, you're gonna be drinking a lot of tea. It's wonderful tea though. And like I said, we'll talk about that in a few more minutes. Um, what you're seeing here is my finished product. This is the, the baklava, but I'm gonna show you how we're doing this. And I know it, it looks intricate, it looks hard, but once you've seen this, you're gonna see how actually easy it is to do. And you're never gonna to wanna to pay a fortune for it again because it's so easy to make yourself. So I'm gonna sit this over here. And the next thing we're going to do is make the syrup. And I know that's out of order for what you have on your recipe. When you're doing it at home, you've got all the time in the world to do this and you can let your syrup cool. But for us here today, I want the syrup to be good and cold and I've only got an hour to work with you. So or not cold, but cooler. So I'm going to go ahead and put my syrup together and I'll show you how we're going to do that. I'll get my pan. And what goes into the syrup is actually um, a cup and a half of sugar. Sometimes I use a little less because I like to use more honey. Do you want to spotlight the mobile version? Uh, sure. My technical director here is trying to move to the overhead camera. Here we go. So we're going to use a cup, about a cup and a half of sugar. and about three quarters of a cup of water. Did everybody uh, find that, that is working with me today, did, were you all able to find the rose water? Because I know some people had emailed me to ask about where to find it. 
Um, my rose water, as you can see, is actually a Persian version. <laughs> um, and I, I have a very large bottle. You can get really small bottles, usually at the international markets, or if you have a Wegmans with an international section, something like that. Um, you probably won't use nearly as much as I do, but I go through a lot of rose water, so I get the bigger bottles. So we are going to do about four tablespoons of the rose water. And this is not an exact science. If you really like the taste of rose water, put more. If you don't like it at all, like one of my children, if I'm making it for her, I leave the rose water out. But it's what makes it authentic. Then we're also going to add about half a cup of honey. Oh, is not open. That's what I get for buying new ones. Alex, can you grab me one of those little green spatulas over there? There we go. Thank you. Okay. And some lemon juice. I said a quarter cup of lemon juice. I usually use about one lemon or one and a half. one and a half. These are a little small. Okay. The next thing is not on here um, because it's not really necessary, but one of the things I love to put in my syrup for my saffron or for my baklava is saffron. So I'm going to bring some saffron over here and show you what I'm talking about. Okay, um, basically saffron is the most expensive spice in the world per weight. And the reason it's so expensive is that it's actually the stigma and the styles of a crocus. And if you think about a crocus, there's only two or three of those little red stigma or styles sticking up. So for every crocus, you only get a few of these little strands of, <laughs> I'm going up, of uh, saffron. You can buy it in the store. Um, I get mine. Luckily, I have a source who comes back and forth from the Middle East regularly. But um, you can get it in the stores here. It's just much more expensive. So I've got all different kinds, smaller packages, larger packages. Um, and obviously, in my opinion, the very best saffron in the world is the saffron from Iran. Um, it uh, originates in Iran. And it's thought that the best saffron in the world comes from a town in Iran called Mashhad. And so if you ever get an opportunity to have Mashhad saffron, that's the best. Um, there are lots of ways to use it. I use it with rice, but I also love to put just a little bit in my syrup for my baklava. Um, this is what it looks like when it's already crushed. You can see I've got it crushed here, but I wanted to show you how you can crush it. So I'm going to take just a few. I've got a nice mortar and pestle here. Mine is um, kind of marble. Put just a little bit of the saffron threads in there. And the best thing you can do, to, because if you, if you try to just mash it yourself, it will mash, but it won't mash as well as it should. So what we like to do is use just a tiny piece of cubed sugar. And I'll talk to you about this a little bit later too when we're talking about the tea. 
but use that, crush up the cube sugar. Okay, let me see if I can scoot this over and show you a little bit better. So you can see I've kind of crushed up the cubed sugar and I've got the saffron down there in the bottom. And now I'm just gonna work it with the, ped the mortar and pestle until it kind of resembles just a fine powder. If you use a lot of saffron, you can do this in advance. I have a um, coffee grinder that I reserve just for crushing saffron with sugar, but if not, the mortar and pestle works really well. And if you're gonna do it ahead of time, I would recommend keeping it in a, um, a jar with a screw top lid or something that's airtight. So I'm gonna put just a pinch or so of that in my syrup just for a little extra color and a little extra flavor. Now I'm just gonna put this on the stove to heat. And give it a stir so that you're letting the water incorporate into the sugar and it's all gonna become a nice syrup. As you can see, starting to um, starting to make it a little yellowish. That's what the saffron does. And normally this would be on the heat and it would I would keep stirring it until you can't tell that the sugar is in there anymore and it's all just one liquid. So I'm gonna put this back over on the heat and let it cook for a few minutes. Okay, um, the other thing I wanted to tell you about saffron is that the region that it's grown in um, really affects the quality. So there is saffron that's grown here in the US, there's saffron that's grown in Spain, in India, but a lot of those places will um, add a little bit of turmeric to the saffron um, to make it look better. And it's not, it's not the really good stuff. You're not gonna really see or or smell or taste it as much. So if you can get the Persian, I recommend you get that. Okay, next up, we're going to move all this sticky stuff out of the way. And start making the baklava. Alex, would you grab my baklava pastry out of the fridge? And one. All right, I've already melted two sticks of butter and I'm using a um, brush. Um, you can use any kind of brush you have. The, um, the nylon brushes like this are pretty good. Those rubber brushes are a little harder to work with, but I know they're pretty popular and a lot of people have them now. And I actually use those for the most part when I do my baklava workshops because they're a little bit um, cheaper. So the, the pastry I get, I mean, you can get any brand. I know a lot of people have different brands. I usually get the longer one because it works better for um, fitting on the tray. And as you can see, it kind of fits right there. So what you're gonna do is, um, I think I put it in the email. Don't ever, 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 <laughs> microwave thaw your phyllo. It's gonna turn into a glutinous mess. So don't do that. Always thaw it either in your refrigerator for a day or two because you're gonna get it frozen at the grocery store. Um, or if you forget and you really wanna use it, lay it out on your kitchen counter for two to three hours and it should be fine to work with. The other thing about the phyllo pastry is that it's very fine and it dries out very quickly. So, once you have it opened up, you're gonna to wanna to work really quickly. And you need a lot of counter space in order to work with it. So I open mine out, as you can see, and lay it on my counter space here. And then, because this one happens to be just about the right 
width to match my pan, I'm only going to need to cut it here to make it fit. So you're going to want a really sharp knife. And let me use this one. And I measure bottom of my pan and just start right about there and make a cut all the way down. Make sure you're cutting all the way through. It, again, it doesn't have to be super straight. It's very forgiving when you start putting it in the pan. And then that's gonna leave you bits or pieces. Sometimes you have to cut it both ways if your pan is a little different shape. Just cut it to fit your pan the best you can. And then if you can take this, Alex, could you get me a, a Ziploc bag? And if you want to use this for something like um, spanakopita or some other um, dish that uses phyllo pastry, you can just put this in. I'll just give that to you. And keep it in your fridge. It should keep for at least a few days. Okay. Now, as I said, this tends to dry out fairly quickly. So what I want to do is make sure I can... You can see everything I'm trying to get in the picture here. All right, are you all seeing that? Are you seeing the tray? Okay, great. I'm seeing both, so it's hard for me to know exactly what you're seeing. Um, so I'm gonna use a slightly damp towel to keep over my pastry as I'm doing it. First thing you wanna do is use your melted butter and give your tray a good brush with the butter. This is not diet food. This is a lot of butter and a lot of sugar, but you're not gonna have too terribly much of it. And it's really decadent and you'll love it. It's great for the holidays. Everybody loves baklava. All right. Now you're gonna take your first layer. And as I said, it's very thin and very fragile. So you're gonna gently pull it. I like to lay it over the far edge away from me and lay it down and gently pull it toward me until it's laying in the middle of the pan. And if it doesn't fit exactly, that's perfectly fine because you're gonna have so many layers you can adjust and it's very forgiving, as I said. Now, what we're gonna do is we're actually going to butter every single layer of this phyllo pastry. So this is the tedious part. This takes a little time. And I've had so many of these workshops and I start out giving everybody two melted sticks of butter. Some people end up with butter left over and that's great because others have used up all of their butter and they're not even halfway through. I don't know how, how it works that way, but some people just really like to lather on the butter. So just make sure you get some butter all over each layer. And as you can see, I'm kind of going down to the other end now because I cut it a little tiny bit, or it was actually a little tiny bit short for my pan. Um, so I'm just gonna keep going that way so that I have some all the way to both ends. The goal here is to try to get about half of the sheets down first. And I can't tell you exactly how many that would be because every phyllo manufacturer puts a different number of sheets in their boxes, but you can just kind of eyeball it. Um, as I'm doing this, I'm going to just explain that um, I am not actually Iranian. I consider myself an honorary Persian or an honorary Iranian because I actually um, have an Iranian passport. I'm a dual citizen because I've been married to my husband who is Persian for a little over 36 years. Yeah, you can turn that down now. Okay, let me just bring that back over. 
So my syrup has now boiled. And as you can see, it's almost, it's like it's clear. You can see the bottom of the pan. Okay. Now I turned that off. I took it off the heat and I'm just gonna sit it on the back of the stove and let it cool down. So yeah, so I'm not Persian myself, but I've been cooking Persian food for about 35, 36 years. And I've learned from what I think are some of the best Persian cooks. Um, it's kind of interesting when you talk about Persian food and you talk about like the rice and how you make your rice. For every, every woman I've watched make rice, there's a little something different about every one of them. So as long as you get the same end result, I guess we're all okay. My husband likes to say he taught me how to cook Persian food, but uh, I also have, and he did, he taught me some things, but I also have some really, really great Persian cookbooks and a lot of great Persian women that I've learned from over the years. And my kids, when they come home for holidays and things like that, the first thing they want is Persian food. Okay, I think I'm getting close to maybe go one more. All right, those of you who are cooking along with me, how's it going? Are you finding the phyllo difficult or is yours coming apart easily? You can unmute if you have any questions or if you wanna just make a comment. Let me know how it's going. I can't see all of you. I can only see the first row right now, the, the mode I'm in. So it's hard for me to see what, what exactly is happening. Um, now I've done about half. So I'm gonna cover my pastry up again here so it doesn't dry out too much. And then before I uh, started with you guys, I went ahead and um, ground up the nuts uh, from the, the uh, nut mixture. So that was the um, walnuts and pistachios, cardamom, and a half a cup of sugar, because I didn't want it to be too loud. Okay. I use a food processor, which is, um, I guess, what anybody would do these days. Pour almost all of it onto your tray. I like to leave maybe a quarter cup or so because I wanna sprinkle it over the top when it's all done to make it more pretty. So if you leave just a little bit there. Now you're gonna use a spoon to smooth it all out and try to make it as even as you can make it. And obviously I've got flour all over me. Um, spoon it out so that it's nice and even all the way to every edge. Tamara, how many, how many layers of the phyllo dough did you say that you did before you put the topping on or the, half, the? Go with about half of what you see. You'll have to just eyeball it. Like I said, it's, it's difficult because you never know how many layers are gonna be in any particular brand's box of pastry, um, but make it about half of what you have just so that it's nice and even. Tam, you're also getting a question in the chat. Someone said, should the syrup boil? Yes, the syrup should boil. That's how it's gonna to come to a nice clear consistency. It can boil for just a, a couple minutes and it should, it should be fine. But then sit it off the heat to cool. You're not, you don't want it cold, cold, but you want it cool. Um, and I'll explain that a little bit when this is done and we're pouring the syrup on. Uh, another question says, I couldn't find the regular pastry. I got the puff version. I hope it works. Oh, puff pastry probably won't work exactly like this. You'll get something that will probably taste similar, but it won't look like this. Um, yeah, what you really needed was the, the um, phyllo pastry sheets, um, as you can see. Um, and like at my store, they have them in this length and then they have some that are shorter. I like to get the, the full size length, sorry, get this big one. And they're with the uh, pie. Yeah, they're usually by the pie crust, things like that. Okay. Now, this is going to be the hardest layer because it's going on to the dry nuts. And so it's going to want to pull up when you're 
putting your butter on. So you just kind of have to work with it and hold it down. Just kind of gently get it on there. And it doesn't have to be perfect because you're going to be putting a lot more butter on. Um, but like I said, your, your nuts are going to want to kind of come up on here and it's going to want to try to pull up. But once you get a couple layers in, it'll be just like the, the previous layers where it's all kind of stuck together and not as hard to work with. And my theory is that it's the butter between each layer that makes it so crispy and crunchy and delicious. So like I said, it's, it's a lot of calories, but a piece is worth it now and then. <laughs> One piece, two pieces, <laughs> or if you're my husband, a few pieces. And if you have tears like I just did there, don't worry about it. Just put it down and put a lot of butter on there and it's gonna soak it right up and you will never know there was a tear. It'll go right back together. That sometimes happens, especially if um, you've tried to thaw it too quickly or it's not quite thawed yet. What I also will do sometimes now that I'm getting down to my last several layers is flip it over because sometimes the bottom sheets are the less pretty ones or they have more, more issues. <laughs> so I put them in the middle so that they won't show. Someone asked a question. Does it help to reheat the butter during this process? If your butter gets hard, yes. If not, if it's still liquidy, go right, just keep going right through it. It depends on how quickly you go and you know what, I guess what the temperature is in your room, if it's gonna stay, stay fairly liquid. I know butter is best, but if trying to make it vegan, would you use olive oil, coconut oil, or vegan margarine? I think I'd probably go with vegan margarine just for the consistency of it, but I guess that's up to you. What you want, and I haven't worked with a lot of vegan margarine. I don't know that oil would work very well, um, but you, what you're looking for is something that's going to make it crunchy and crispy. So whatever that means in the vegan world. Uh, if someone's saying, my phyllo is in shreds, I assume it's okay as long as I get it all covered with butter. That's right. Yep. If you've got lots of pieces, just piece it all together, lay it in the pieces to make it look like it's, you know, pretty much the, the triangle, and then cover it with butter, and it will be fine. Now the top layer, you want to give a really good butter bath. Um, someone asked, is there a trick to getting all the layers apart to make it look so easy? Um, I think it's got to do with the thawing process. Like I said, I've tried to um, use it when it wasn't completely thawed and it was more difficult. It should be if it's good phyllo and you've you've allowed it to thaw properly like in the fridge over a couple days or even on the counter for a few hours and it's good and, and thawed out, it, it should come apart pretty easily. Occasionally there'll be a little bit of a sticky part that you might have to deal with, but just pull it apart and do the best you can. So let me get this out of the way so you can now see what I'm gonna do. All right, this is also one of the key parts of baklava making. Um, one time I forgot this step and it was the only time because it completely ruins your entire tray of baklava. So don't forget, you've got to cut it into the diamond shapes before you bake it. Otherwise you get a puffy mess that is just 
a mess. So um, again, I'm using a really, really sharp knife and I'm gonna start on one corner and cut across in a straight line. Make sure you're going all the way down to the bottom. And yes, you're gonna tear up your, your pan because that knife is gonna put scratches in the bottom of your pan. So I have a couple of designated baklava pans that I use. And then just, you know, it depends on how, how big a piece you want, but I give it, you know, an inch, an inch and a half, whatever this is here, I guess about a little over an inch and do the same thing and go all the way down in straight lines. And you might have to kind of hold on to it here and there because the pastry is going to kind of try to pop up a little bit. Oh, uh, someone asked, does it matter what type of brush you use for the butter? So it's silicone baking brush work. Yes, a silicon one will work. I've used those. Um, I, I think they're, um, if you're talking about the more, here, let me see. Um, yeah, so I have a couple of different ones that I've used. Like this one you can see is kind of that rubber with a, a, a another rubber in the middle. This one is completely silicon. Is this what you're talking about? Those will work. The one I was using was more of a nylon brush. Um, they'll all work. You just have to see how much butter it's releasing. Make sure you get the butter on there really good. Okay, once you've got that done, I flip it around and I go the other way. So I start in the corner. And this one is a little more difficult. They do want to pop up because they're all kind of individual at this point, but you just keep going in a straight line. Someone asked, is the nut mixture half walnut and half pistachio? What is a good sub for walnuts? Hmm. Okay. So um, as you probably know, a lot of cultures claim baklava. The Russians claim it, the Greeks claim it, the Persians obviously claim it. Um, the nuts are what kind of is the difference, the different mixtures of nuts. Um, because the Persian kind of national product is um, a pistachio, they always use pistachios, but I think nothing but pistachio would be way too rich. So that's why they also use a lot of walnuts and they also grow a lot of walnuts. Um, I know some people use almonds. If almonds work better for you, you could do that. Um, I've never really seen it with much other than walnuts, almonds, pistachios. I don't know if anybody else has had any that had any other nuts, maybe you could make a comment about it, but I haven't seen that. I guess, honestly, it would probably be fine with whatever nuts you're more most comfortable with. I really don't think peanuts would work very well. I think you would get nothing. It would be very peanutty. Pecans? Maybe, although pecans are a pretty strong flavor too. Um, you could give it a shot and see. Just a minute here. Make sure that it's not boiling over. Okay. All right. As you can see, I'm having a little trouble with it wanting to lift up too. And once your fingers get a little buttery, it clings to your fingers. Getting close here. Is everybody having, are you getting, getting your diamonds cut? Those of you who are cooking along, is it working out? Okay. Where did that towel go? Okay. All right. So as you can uh, see, yeah, uh, questions? So, uh, no, just uh, some updates from people that are cooking along. Uh, Kate is still making the layers of the phyllo shreds and the nuts <laughs> haven't been put on yet. They've okay. Out. Um, and then uh, another one, Isabella WPSU says diamonds are going well. This is fun. Great, great. Okay. 
So this is what it should look like when you're ready to put it in the oven. And I'm gonna hand mine off to my lovely assistant, my son, and he's gonna stick it in a 350 oven for me. And we're gonna put a timer on that for about 25 minutes. And then um, that's just to ensure that it's cooked all the way through. And then once that happens, we will go ahead and um, increase the temperature to brown it slightly. All right, let me wash my hands real quick. Okay. All right, now I'm gonna grab another towel because I've got all wet. And we're gonna talk a little bit about Persian tea and the history while everything's cooking. So um, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, as everybody knows, tea was most likely discovered in China like 5,000 years ago. Um, the history of it in Iran, as far as we can tell, dates back to the late 1500s or early 1600s, and it was traded on the Silk Road, so it was quite a commodity back then. Tea is now grown in the mountainous northern areas of Iran, um, in the G Gilan area near the Alborz Mountains. Um, Iran has um, two huge mountain ranges, and the ones up in the north are the Alborz. Uh, let's see. Persian tea is basically a blend of Earl Grey and Darjeeling. It's all a black tea, has a lot of caffeine. And as I said, if you're in a Persian house, you're gonna be drinking a lot of it. So uh, you, you have to either build up a tolerance for it or just plan to be awake all night. Uh, I wanna talk to you a little bit about samovars now. So years and years ago, uh, when I was newly married, my in-laws sent this very fancy non-usable samovar. And you will see a lot of these in Persian houses as well. This one happens to be um, the Persian. No, we'll, we'll turn in just a minute. This one happens to be the Persian. Okay, Alex, let's just turn around and we'll talk about it. The Persian um, electrical thing. So I obviously I can't use it. Um, so it's just decorative for me. But this is the same theory. Um, normally, it would be plugged in, or if you had a really old one, the bottom would have a charcoal um, mechanism where you put charcoal in and light it, almost like a grill. So the theory here is that you put water in this part, like in, in my stovetop one, and the water heats, and you put your actual loose tea into the teapot. And when the water's good and hot, you would put the teapot underneath and allow the water to go into here. And what that's gonna do is make a really, really strong tea concentrate. So you put it back up on top and let it, let it steep. This is just a drip bowl that comes with the fancy ones. So you let it steep. And then we're gonna come back over here and you'll see that I have Got this now going and it, it smells really, really good too. I wish you were here to smell it. And then I want to tell you a little bit about, first I'll show you the color. So um, the strength of the tea, obviously, if it's a stronger tea, it's darker. If it's, if it's a lighter tea, um, it's, it's a lighter color. But what you're going to be doing is using this really concentrated tea and pouring a little bit in the bottom. And you can see it's a nice amber color. Yeah, a little closer to camera. Like this. And then you come back to the samovar, and depending on how strong you want your tea, you put some of the hot water from the bottom into it. And that's about the right color. I like mine a little darker. Some people like theirs a little lighter, so it just depends. And this is called an estacon this little teacup. They use these in other countries too. Uh, there are some that are Turkish um, and some others. And usually you get a little saucer with it because the glass gets very hot because it's glass. There are a lot of other forms of Estacon and I brought just a few of mine over to show you. Let's come back over here, Alex. Okay. Um, yeah, back to that. 
Okay, it's gonna switch us back down. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, well, I don't know though. It might be better mm -hmm. to, I guess they can see this way. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so this is a more Americanized version of the teacups. Like you can get these at TJ Maxx or a lot of other um, stores. This is a very Persian style of Estacon. And these are the really fancy version. Like I have a whole set of these again that I got on my first trip to Iran and the cup comes out of the, of the holder and goes back in. So you just would need to wash this. Um, and those are for fancy and they have these fancy little spoons that go with. This is another set that someone gifted me that are really nice. These are much larger as you can see depending on how much tea you want to drink, one's a lot larger than the other. And then I wanted to show you, um, Alex, let's go back to the other view. I think mm -hmm. it's going to be easier. Okay. Okay. I want to show you the variety of things that you can put in your tea. First of all, one of the, one of the things that I love to do with tea is to put cardamom pods in it, the whole pod, um, usually the green ones. And again, that gives it a really lovely aroma. You can also get Persian tea that has saffron in it already. So you're getting that saffron um, smell. But what people do, they usually use either um, sugar cubes, and these are different than the white sugar cubes we have here in the US. These are um, denser and they come in a cone shape. So you get a large cone and you actually break it up with like a hammer or something heavy, the end of, an, of a big knife or something. And you break it up so you'll see they're all different shapes and sizes. So they're not uniform like the sugar cubes we're used to seeing. They also can use these rock candy. And as you can see, this one has little threads of saffron in it. You see the saffron? So you can get these on a stick. And one of these is usually like, a lot of people will share these sticks because if you, if you let this entire stick melt in your in your tea, you're gonna have some really, really sweet tea. So a lot of people will share these. They'll use it for a, you know, a minute and then they'll hand it off to the next person so that everybody gets a little bit of the sweetness. Another thing that I really love, oh, and those come in different, um, you can get those in different containers, different things. Um, if you don't have a Persian store where you live, which we don't, and you don't have somebody who travels back and forth all the time, you can also order any of this stuff online, just Google Persian grocery stores. And there are a lot of really great online Persian markets that you can get things from. Another thing that I really like um, is called pulaki. So these are little bitty sugar wafers. And I, these I believe have a saffron in them as well. So they're very thin. And what the Persian person would do would be they would put it in their mouth and hold it on their tongue as they're drinking the tea and it will kind of melt along with the tea. Same thing with the sugar cubes. They'll put a sugar cube in their mouth and hold it in their mouth and drink the tea kind of through the sugar cube. So it's kind of an interesting way to look at it. And I've always wondered why they don't all have terrible teeth if they're doing this with all the sugar on their teeth all the time. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the, the sugar that we use in the various teas. And I'm going to come back over here and show you how this would work. You would kind of leave it in your very warm tea. The other thing I find fascinating in Iran is that the people there can drink this tea steaming boiling hot. You can see the steam coming off of this and they'll just drink it straight down. I usually let mine sit long enough that the hostess gets worried and comes around and says, oh, your tea has cooled off. Let me get you some fresh. And I always say, no, 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 that's, I did that intentionally. I really, I can't drink it as hot as you do. I need it cooler. So um, this is how that would look. Do you ever add honey or milk slash cream? Um, honey, yes. A lot of people like honey in their tea and that's very common. I, I've never seen a Persian add milk. I think that's a very European, very British um, thing to do. So I've never seen that in Iran. Um, I've been to Iran many, many, many times. Um, we actually have a place in Iran, an apartment that we own where we can stay when we're there. And uh, so 
when our children were little, we would go quite a bit to, to introduce them to the culture and, and the family members. Um, and my favorite time in Iran is right now, this time in Iran in October. It's beautiful, it's fall. Um, the geography of Iran is very, very similar to the US in that the north is colder and mountainous. The central region is a lot like um, probably the mid middle of America, maybe like Tennessee down in that area. Um, although it does get a little warmer. And then the Southern region is all desert. Um, and it's, it's a lot of desert and it's very, very hot down there. So, but the, but the really interesting thing is that you can go in a matter of hours from the desert up to the mountains and the mountains in Iran prior to the Iranian revolution were known to be some of the best skiing in the world. There's a ski resort there called Dizin that um, prior to, you know, the, the, the Shah, uh, the fall of the Shah in the late 70s was really a premium resort and people from all over the world went there to go skiing. Um, so any other questions? Okay, um, another really fun thing in Iran this time of year is that this is the season when the pomegranates are ripe. And so uh, the first couple of times we went there, my husband's family owns pomegranate orchards um, in their home village down in central Iran in a town called um, Natanz. Actually, the town is Badrud. It's in the region of a bigger town called Natanz um, in the Kashan area. And we would go and his uncle, who was very elderly even at that time, knew every single tree. And he knew if you wanted a, a tart pomegranate, you went to this tree. If you wanted a sweet pomegranate, you went to that tree. Um, they were different colors. They were just beautiful. And the pomegranates we see here in the US are you know, nothing compared to the size and the, the taste of the pomegranates that you can find in Iran this time of year. Uh, how much time do we have on the timer, Alex? 14. Okay. So we have a few more, about 10, 12 more minutes until we need to uh, put the time up on the oven. Does anyone have any questions or any of you who are cooking along? Do you have any, anything you need to ask? Tamara, I have a question for you, and that is, do you have a favorite um, restaurant or type of food that complements your tea when you're there visiting? Um, well, Iranian restaurants, they are getting more westernized restaurants and um, knockoffs of things like KFC or or McDonald's or fast food type things, but really it's the, the local Persian food restaurants that we enjoy going to. And there are different types. There are some that are much more um, like a Western style restaurant with normal tables and chairs where you sit. Um, there are others that are more like the village um, regions. So when you go in, the furniture is much more rustic and the, the things on the walls are, are very, um, uh, local to that region. And then there are the outdoor ones that I love even more. Um, and those are really fun. I wish I wish we had one close by here and, and we don't. Um, when the weather is good enough, you know, in, it, not in the winter, you can go to those restaurants and it's like a, a platform that's about, I'd say a foot to maybe 15 inches off the ground. And it's a big platform with a big Persian rug on it. And there's um, a railing all the way around three sides of the platform. So you, of course, enter from the side without a railing and you take your shoes off and you climb onto this platform and there are um, pillows all around the, the uh, railing as well. And you sit back against those and you cross your legs or sit with your legs out, however you're more comfortable. But that's where you sit and talk and drink tea and that's where they serve your food. So that's a really, really traditional um, restaurant. In Iran, a lot of people still now these days um, will sit on what they call a sofre, which is a beautiful tablecloth, kind of like the one you can see here um, that my, my computer is resting on a cardboard box and I wanted to cover it up. So uh, tablecloths like this, they put those on the floor um, especially because they have such large groups of people. You know, um, the, the culture in Iran is that it's, it's completely family oriented. So um, not even just on the weekends, but a lot of weeknights, you will see people gathering at one or the other sister or brother or cousin or grandparents house for a meal all together. And so you might have 20 people or more 
over for dinner in any given evening. And, and of course, in the old days, they didn't even have tables and chairs like we have now. A lot of the more modern families do have those. But even so, when they have a big group like that, they still will put a sofre on the floor and um, they put the food all in the middle, like family style and plates and you know utensils all the way around. And you each sit cross-legged up close to the, uh, the tablecloth and that's where you eat. Um, for those of us who are not used to that, it can be a little hard to sit cross-legged and try to eat. Um, and it's, it can also be a little difficult getting up and down. So it's usually the hostess who um, kind of stays up and continues to bring things back and forth or the youngest member of the, the family, um, the, the kids, they, they do the running a lot. And then um, one of the, the best things I remember is that um, anytime we would do that and it would be time for everybody to kind of get up from the floor, get up from the sofa and time to clean up, everybody would kind of help taking things into the kitchen, but it's usually the youngest child's job, not an infant, but the youngest, you know, I guess maybe five or six years old and up to um, bring a, a, a like a, a dish towel, I guess you would call it. And they start at one end of the sofre, one of the short ends, and they brush all of the, the, you know, leftover, whatever fell off the plates, rice usually, and other things. They brush it forward, they roll up the tablecloth, brush it forward, roll up the tablecloth and keep going until they get at the very end, a pile of the, the stuff that needs to be thrown out. And then they gather that up and throw it away and the tablecloth has been cleaned off and they take it and put it away. So that's, that's interesting that it was usually the kids that got to do that. Um, another interesting thing, our first trip to Iran was when my kids were all very little. Um, actually, my youngest wasn't even born yet. And we arrived at the airport in Iran in, late at night. And there were so many family members waiting because my husband had not been home for 16 years at that point. He got out just as the Shah was falling. And so the revolution was happening and he was here in the US going to school. So it had been 16 years since he had been home. And there were so many people at the airport that we all ended up in different people's cars going back to his mother's house. And we were in a caravan of people honking horns, people hanging out windows, yelling, you know, very happy that he was back. He's the oldest son of the family. So it was a big deal for them. Um, and my kids had been separated. They were all in different cars. I didn't know where they were, but they were all with family. And I remember my husband yelling at them, telling them to slow down and stop because, you know, he was not used to that anymore. He had been living here in the States and that was, you know, completely unacceptable here, but there it's really normal and natural. So we, we got to his mother's house and um, she came out with a, it's kind of like, I guess what you would call an incense burner. And it's kind of a traditional thing to kind of bless the travelers as they arrive. So she would bring the incense burner out and kind of welcome us. And in Iran, um, they do have beef and chicken and things like that, but their primary meat is lamb. And so we got to his mother's house and we went up and there was a lamb tied up in the courtyard of the house. And of course my kids were like, oh, yay, lammy, let's go play with the lamb. You know, we have a pet for the, the time we're here. And my husband looked at me and I could just see terror in his eyes and he called his brother over and I heard him angrily saying something to his brother and I didn't know what was going on. It hadn't occurred to me and I had been awake for 36 hours with three screaming kids. Um, but I later found out that that was dinner. And so uh, they were going to um, be um, slaughtering the animal um, as a, a, a thanks for our safe travel. And then we would be having it for dinner. So uh, he told his brother to take it to the neighbor's house and do his business with it over there and not let the kids know what was happening. So that was, that was an interesting first encounter. And then we all went inside and um, again, his mother's house, we all sat on the floor around the room on these lovely pillows and things. And they had lots and lots of questions for us. And uh, the two questions that always stick out in my mind were that they told my husband there was no way, he, they said he had lied to them, there was no way that I was American because in their view, an American looked like Linda Evans from Dallas, you know, six feet tall, blonde, you know, built like crazy. So they didn't think there was any way I could possibly be American. And we assured them that I was. And then the other thing that they asked was, this was in, 
gosh, 1995, I think was our first trip over. And even back then, their question was, we see on the news that children in the United States bring guns to school. Is that, is that normal? Is that, is that true? Um, or is this just propaganda? And unfortunately, we had to say yes, you know, things, things like that happened. So um, I guess my point with that is just that we all hear the worst about each other um, in the media. And all you see is the, the crazy things that happen over there or things with the Ayatollah or Ahmadinejad, who was just a, a crazy man when he was uh, you know, in, in charge over there. But that's not the people, just like the people here are not the people that they see on the news. And that's my point. And that's what I wanna get across that the people there want exactly what you and I want. They want healthy children with food on the table and a roof over their head. They wanna work, they don't wanna hand out, they wanna be able to work and raise their kids. And the sanctions that the US has put on them has caused horrible hardships for everyone, um, horrible uh, inflation, people can't afford rice let alone meat and things. So it's, it's really difficult. And I just have to keep hoping that things will get better and people will understand that, you know, they're not the enemy. Governments, governments need to work things out, but people are people. Any other questions? Is everybody getting, getting through? There were a couple questions in the chat, Tamara. Um, one was, should the towel you cover the pastry sheets with be damp? Yeah, just slightly. Like I had literally dried my hands on it a couple times, so it was slightly damp, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be wet. You don't want it to be wet. Kate's cutting her diamonds. All right. <laughs> um, someone asked, what are your favorite Persian dishes or desserts? I'm not sure if you answered that okay. in some of your... um, My favorite Persian dish is um, eggplant stew, which is called um, Khoresh Badam John in Persian. Badam John means eggplant and Khoresh means stew. And so um, it's a stew made of um, beef, you, you stew beef. And the, the primary spices in Persian cooking are turmeric and paprika. So it's not spicy at all, not hot spice like you think of with like Thai food and that sort of thing. Um, so I love the, that stew. Um, so it's eggplants that you fry and you slice tomatoes and fry them. And then you layer it like a lasagna, the eggplant, the tomato, the stew over the top, eggplant, lasagna, stew over the top. And then you bake it and you serve it with rice. And in Iran, the only rice is basmati rice. They, they don't eat short grain rice. And if it's not basmati, it's not rice to them. And there are lots of really fun ways to cook the rice. Um, my plan is going forward, as you guys know, this is our first world kitchen. Uh, Persian New Year is in March every year. And so my, my plan is that in March, I will do kind of a special Persian New Year world kitchen. And I will show you some of the Persian dishes that I love to cook and that would be traditional for New Year's. And I will specifically show you how they do the different rice because that's the, the most fun and the most important thing. The, the rice, when we do it, it looks like a cake. It's got a hard shell on the outside called the tadik. And um, you kind of cut into it. And the kids and my husband all fight over who gets the tadik. Everybody wants the tadik. Um, so that's, you'll learn more about that in March if we <laughs> are able to keep going um, for that one. Um, my favorite dessert in Iran, I can't get here. It's Persian ice cream. And it's, it's a little different than our ice cream. It's more like chunks of cream. And I really love that. And then it has another, um, oh, I don't even know how to explain it. It's called Falude. It goes with the ice cream. The ice cream is called Bastani and then Falude goes with it. And it's like little, um, little slivers of, hmm. I don't even know what it is. Like not a noodle, but, but sort of looks like a little piece of a noodle or something but um, it gets uh, rose water and syrup pulled, poured over it. And that's all eaten together. And then my second favorite thing that we do have here or that we actually make all the time, my son is really, really good at making them is cream puffs. They are expert cream puff makers in Iran. And oh, the one thing I was gonna tell you is um, 
no Iranian woman taught me how to do any of the baking because Iranian ladies generally don't bake. There is a pastry shop on every corner in Iran and pastries are relatively inexpensive or they were before, before inflation got so bad. So they don't bake. And when we would go to Iran and my husband would say, you know, that I make all these pastries and I do all these things, they were always surprised because they never did that themselves. So that was a lot of fun. And like I said, if anybody's interested, I have some great, great Persian cookbooks I can recommend if you'd like to learn more about Persian food. Someone just asked that. Yeah, I do that have. <laughs> um, my Wegmans package comes with two rolls of phyllo. Should I use them both? You Yes, because usually what that means is they've divided it in half. So use the first package um, on the bottom half and then the, the other package on the top. So our oven is beeping. Let's um, let's see, Alex. Can you maybe bring that around and we'll look in the oven? Oh, no. Yeah, just bring it around here. Okay. So <laughs> I don't know if you can see how it's looking right now. So it's obviously puffed up and it's getting a little brown, but it's not as brown as we want it to be. We want it to be a really nice golden color. So we're gonna put it back in there and bake it at 450 for just a few minutes. And this, you have to kind of keep an eye on because it's gonna go really fast right now um, and it's gonna brown quickly. So I usually just actually stand here and, and keep watching it to see that I don't get it too brown. And that's happened occasionally where I've let it get a little too dark and that's not the end of the world. Um, when you pour the syrup on it, um, it makes it look much better. So it's, it's not gonna be a big problem. Um, there was also a previous question about, uh, my pan is bigger than the phyllo. Will that be a problem? Or, cause it seemed okay when I was putting it together. My pan is, is bigger, bigger than the phyllo, bigger than the dough. No, like I said, if, you're, if your pan is larger, you just offset them, like do, do um, one layer or one piece of the phyllo at one end and then the next piece of phyllo lay it toward the other end. So you're kind of alternating back and forth and filling the whole space. You do want it to fill the whole space. And next time you can kind of think about maybe a different size pan if that's important to you for it to look quite right. Um, how do you store the baklava after making it? Okay, so um, what I'm gonna show you is, Alex, why don't you bring that other tray over that, I prepared some this morning so that it would be done and you could see what it actually looks like when it's all cooled and done. So what you wanna do is leave it um, on the tray to cool until it's nice and cool. This is where I took some out. You can see mine that was finished. Um, when it's done, you can either leave it in the tray, and I, I do recommend that if you're not gonna eat it quickly, leave it in the tray and cover it with, um, I usually put a piece of parchment paper over the top so that the syrup doesn't stick and then cover it with saran wrap or foil on top of that parchment paper and wrap it up and store it in the refrigerator. And it'll keep at least a week, maybe a little bit longer. Um, we've probably used it quite a bit longer actually <laughs> because um, as you'll also see the edges are the kind that are the sides that are a little darker and not exactly the right shape. They're kind of a triangle instead of a diamond. And those are usually the ones that um, if I'm making this for a dinner party or for to take to work for a party or something, my husband and my kids get the edges and they all like, <laughs> they like to have the edges. So that'll sit in the fridge for a while and they'll just pick at it. Um, so yeah, that's how we do that. I'm gonna double check and make sure we're not, we're beginning to get darker. So we'll give that another minute. Um, so yeah, keep it in the fridge, but don't put it in the fridge warm. Let, let it sit out on a cooling rack or somewhere until it's completely cooled to room temperature and then put the parchment paper and the covering on and put it in the fridge. Um, the reason that we did the syrup in advance was because I wanted it to cool. And when I take this baklava out, I want you to listen carefully and I'll try to, Alex, which one of the speakers is it that's, that's the they're laptop. picking up? Okay, so I'll try to pour it closer to the laptop here so that you can hear it. What you wanna do is hear that sizzle. And what that means is that because the baklava is very, very warm and the syrup is cool, the baklava is just gonna suck that syrup right up into the layers of the phyllo and the nuts. And that's how you want it to be. 
Um, if you haven't done that, if you haven't uh, made your syrup yet, what you can do is the reverse. You can go ahead and make your baklava and let it cool to room temperature and then do your syrup and the syrup can be piping hot and pour it onto the cool baklava and you'll get the same effect. But I think it works better this way. Do you want this over there? Um, put that right here in front and I will get this out. Well, they aren't gonna be able to see. Yeah, that's okay, oh, I just want them here. All right, now, as you can see, it's a little more golden brown. That's what we're looking for. And I'm putting it on there. Um, let's see, let's go around over here, Alex. Yep, right around here. Can they see it? Yep. I can switch the okay. other one. There we go. Nice. So I'm going to give my syrup a little bit of a stir and my baklava is good and hot. And now listen carefully. And if your tray's not completely even like mine or your countertop maybe isn't, I can see that my syrup's kind of pooling on this one end. I want to give it a little tilt to make sure that it's going all the way through. And you may not be able to hear it right now, but I can hear that it's kind of still sucking some up there. So that is our finished product. And as I said, I would leave this sit out for maybe an hour or more to cool. And then, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, Alex, thanks. Like I said, Alex reminded me. Um, once you've got the syrup on there, if you wanna just sprinkle some of your leftover nut mixture to look a little pretty. And so as you can see, it, like at a restaurant, they often charge like $3 a piece for baklava. So this would be quite a lot of, <laughs> a lot of money in that tray. Um, so it's, it's really not that hard to do. As you can see, it, it didn't take that much time. It's pretty simple. Uh, is baklava meant to be eaten at room temperature? When you take it out of the refrigerator, should you bring it to room temperature before serving? Yeah, that's a really great question. Thanks for asking. Um, it, it should not be cold. So yes, sit it out and bring it out. Like if you're going to have a uh, have dinner, bring it out when you're starting dinner or something and let it come closer to room temperature. It doesn't have to be cold, uh, hot by any means, but it should be closer to room temperature. Uh, also, when you're going to... Um, take it out of the tray. The other thing I forgot to mention is now that this is like this, I would wait until it's cooled again, um, like wait an hour or so, but then I would go ahead and take that sharp knife of mine and go back through every single layer and make sure that I cut it all the way through again, just in case any of the layers fused a little as they were cooking, that'll make it a lot easier to get out. And you can just use a, a big, big fork or if you have a nice spatula, small spatula to kind of the first couple pieces are usually a little harder to get out than, than others. Um, but it's pretty easy to do. And um, as I had out when you guys started, you can, you know, put it in a, in a tray decoratively or just put it on there any way you want. Um, if you're gonna serve it, this would be kind of how I would maybe serve it with the tea and a couple of pieces. Any other questions? Lots of people thanking you for the tutorial and saying <laughs> it looks amazing. Great. I hope you guys like this. I hope you're going to join us again in November. Keep an eye on our website. In November, we're going to be doing um, pumpkin roll for uh, American fall holidays and also 
another Persian version of a roll, which is a whipped cream called a cake a roulette. Um, and so that, that will also have rose water. So if you purchased rose water for this one and you have some left, hang on to it for next month. Oh, great. I hope they all do turn out well. I would love it if you would send me photos of your finished product. That would be great. Um, we have been recording this and I'm hoping it all comes out well and we're going to archive it on our website. So if you need to go back and look at it later, it should be on our website um, sometime next week once I get our multimedia team to get it put up there. If you have any other questions, you guys all have my email address. Email me and I'd be happy to answer your question. Um, anything else? If not, thanks to all my friends from all around the country who uh, logged on today. I appreciate all of you, Alice and Sarah and my mom and everybody else and my husband from Oman who, who logged in. Thank you so much for watching and um, I hope I see you all again next month in November. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks, Tamara. This was great. Thanks. Bye. All right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Mo. Bye, Bye, Mo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Great job, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know who's going to.